Ellen is going to give us our, our talk today, so I'm going to hand it over to Ellen now. Thank you, Patty. Is it on? No. I think it's on now, so can you hear me online? Okay. Okay, good. Thank you, I think. Maybe I don't know everybody, but I know almost everybody. My name is Ellen. I'm a student of uh, Lama Jimpas. And today I'm going to do a talk about donuts, which is very exciting for me. Um, and not just donuts, but actually what's inside of a jelly donut. So the jelly part of the donut, that's going to be sort of my source of imagery for today's talk. Um, but seriously, when I asked Lama, I, did, I made that mistake of going to Darshan and saying, Lama, what would you like me to talk about in my next talk? And he said, well, mandalas. And I had done a talk, it seems like not very long ago. I don't know if any of you remember it, but I did a talk on mandalas, including putting together this video that was very amateurish, but got a lot of images together about mandalas. Um, and I talked about uh, Chogam Tromka's book, um, The Mandala Principle. And it seems like it was just yesterday. When I looked back, it was at the end of 2018, which is pretty unbelievable to me. Um, but so when Lamala asked me to talk about mandalas, I was like, are you kidding me? Because I feel like I had exhausted everything I could possibly learn about mandalas. And I still didn't know very much. And now I had to talk again about it again. Um, but OK, I, I took the challenge. And in fact, I really like the concept of mandalas. And it, I think it comes in part from the fact that I care about people and the world and us living together effectively and interacting effectively on this earth. And I started out in my young adulthood becoming an engineer because at the time, that's the way that I knew how to help people, to try to help people was build stuff that was useful or design stuff that was useful. And then I went to business school and public policy school and I kept just trying to find more and more ways to be of benefit to, you know, to the world. And I was really happy to have found Buddhism because it's opened up a whole set of new dimensions about how to, you know, how to improve my own human effectiveness and how to help other people. So I, I see mandalas as sort of a continuity of that, the way I'm getting to know them, that really provides some access to us, to, to ways of being that maybe we aren't always in tune with. So I do like it. I have this sort of this love-hate thing with it because I don't really understand it well yet or relate to it well, but I'm happy to be here. So in terms of sources, of course, my number one source is Lama. I, I had a few darshans with him to talk about it. And he's talked quite a bit on this subject, too. So I always listen carefully. He recommended two books to me. And I don't know if you guys back there, our, our tech gurus can show these, these um, cover shots of them. One of them is Myriad Worlds by John Myung Control. It's one of the Treasury of Knowledge volumes. For those of you that are doing the Buddha study program, Buddha Dharma study, I think Lamala assigned us the second volume, but this is the first volume. The other book is called The Mandala and Visions of Wholeness by Rob Priest, who's written several books. And that's the other image. I don't know if you can show that in case people want to see it. Um, or you can let us know if you're not catching these titles. Uh, and then I have a few other bits and pieces that I'll reference that, yeah, that's the second one bits and pieces that I'll reference as we go along. Um, the fundamentals of, uh, you know, the Treasury of Knowledge and this Jom Yong Contra book, I did read it. In fact, I'm on my second or third read of it. It um, talks about cosmology a lot, Buddhist cosmology, which is something that's hard to get your hands around if you're a pragmatic person like me. It doesn't seem to make much sense necessarily or be something very familiar. It talks about the roots of samsara, which I found quite interesting. Um, and it talks a lot about cosmology and tantra. I don't yet know exactly how it connects to mandalas. So maybe I'll come back in three more years when I understand it better and we can talk more about that book. But I will talk about this priest book quite a bit. I found it helpful. Um, Rob Priest comes from a sort of a Western psychology perspective. And this talk, I really oriented to really practical, you know, sort of hands-on felt sense of mandalas. So a lot of what I'll talk about is inspired by his book or I have some excerpts from it. Um, 
So one of the things that Priest emphasizes, and I think Lamas emphasizes too, is that mandalas are, are like a process that run through our lives. And, uh, you know, you could, we use mandala, the, the term, in many different ways. Like, for example, in the back of the room, which you won't be able to see online, but there's a tantra of the Kala Chakra mandala, and I'm sure a lot of you have looked at it before, and it's very complicated. It's a 2D image representation, and that mandala, we call a mandala, very complicated. But Priest, in his book, encourages the readers, the students, to not get caught up in the complexity of the imagery of a mandala, but rather to instead get familiar with the nature of mandala phenomena and how they flow through our lives as, as more of a process or a felt sense. And it's something that's moving and changing all the time. You know, so it's just like a flowy, think of it as sort of a flowy thing. Um, and he, and so this moving, changing thing is going on. And Lamala talks about this a lot. He frequently mentions patterns or like sine waves, you know, the waves of a mandala. And he says, look for the pulsating or waving nature of mandalas. So envision this, you know, energy, I think is a bad word, but this sort of flowy quality going on in life. <clears throat> I think also what I'm learning and interested in learning, <clears throat> excuse me, and experiencing is sort of the heart and soul quality to mandalas. And when I think of the word mandala, I don't get that feeling necessarily, even from the term. It's not one of those words to me that sort of invokes the experience of how it sounds. Mandala to me more invokes sort of the complicated structure, but I'm really trying to tap in now to the, the warmth and heart and soul of the quality of mandala. And that's really what I wanna to share today. Um, another thing that priests emphasizes and I, I think is important to keep in touch with is that mandala is a, a wholeness and not an end state in itself. Um, and so it can be seen as a vision of our potential wholeness, but that wholeness is not really an end state goal that we just focus on. And I, most of us here online now are, and you can get rid of that image if you want to. Um, most of us here are quite experienced Buddhists now. And I look at who's online. I know when I was a, a budding Buddhist that I, I, I made this mistake. I didn't really know what it was like to be enlightened. I sort of viewed me as a small, ordinary, solid, you know, flawed human being. And I thought that if I did the path, then sometime, someday, probably not in my lifetime, but in eons and eons, I would become a Buddha and I would be enlightened and my quality would be totally different. Like, but I sort of had this view of this expansiveness of me, this, you know, all everywhere kind of quality where I'm not so solid. I'm really a big, a big me that can do lots of things and be really useful. And that's in part where this analogy I came to of a donut is you know, that I was this little version of me in the middle of the circle. And someday I would be, you know, a big version that could be very useful to other people. I really had no idea what, what, what it looked like. But I think the booby trap I felt fell into was thinking that I'm waiting until I get there. I'm here and I'm gonna work real hard and I'll be there sometime. And when I'm there, everything will be right in the world. And I think what's wrong about that is we miss the in-between part. You know, and that's really what occurred to me in this jelly and the donut part, you know, between the middle and the outside is all this sweet, gooey, rich, tasty experience. And I was going to just share um, a personal story that I think is where I ran into this situation. I think everybody knows, most of you know anyway, that within the last couple of years, I got divorced. And Rick and I were married for 26 years. Elizabeth, maybe we'll relate. We're actually married for 26.2 years. If you're a marathon runner, you know what that means. But, you know, it's, I think, uncanny that we were happy to be married for the same length of time as a marathon is in miles. We were together for 10 years before that. So that's 36 years. For both of us, we were together more years of our lives than we weren't, you know? So it's like having two-thirds of your body taken away 
it was a really big deal. Um, and I didn't go into my marriage thinking I was only going to be married for 26.2 years. I thought I was doing the 100 mile, uh, miler version. You know, I thought it was forever. And it was like the biggest project, my marriage and family, that I took on. And I knew that when I went into it. And I was happy to do that. So I worked really hard to not have that dissolve. But about 10 years ago or so, or 10 years before the divorce, we started having some dysfunction, you know, more dysfunction show up. Um, and I, you know, I did all the things I know to do, nonviolent communication, therapy, you know, I tried to do everything. And it was about the time that I really was practicing a lot or, you know, fresh in my Buddhist path. And so I, part of my motivation for my Buddhist path was to make me better, you know, a better person, give me tools to help fix the relationship or at least be useful in the relationship. And, um, but I kind of looked at it like, what would I do? How would I be in my marriage if I was enlightened? <clears throat> you know, and so I sort of thought if I was enlightened, first of all, I would know what to do, even though I didn't know what to do. But how can I be in my marriage as an enlightened being, you know, from the outer circle version? So I tried to be as patient as possible. I tried to be as compassionate as possible. Lojong, you know, I practiced all this stuff. Um, but I think what, and of course, ultimately it didn't, wasn't, wasn't enough, didn't work, whatever. But what I think my mistake was, is I didn't, I wasn't present to my experience and the version of me that was existing during that period of time. You know, I just looked at it like well, someday when I'm an enlightened being, it won't bother me. You know, we won't have these conflicts. I'll know what to do. And I think that was a mistake actually. Um, I think it was a big mistake. Uh, and I think it, had I been present really and accepted the experiences I was having as they were unfolding, that I maybe could have reduced the suffering in the, in the relationship. Um, I'm not saying I could have saved it necessarily, but I think I sort of like prolonged the suffering of it by sort of not being present in the version of me that was there. And I think that's our opportunity, you know, to really live our lives aware of, of life where we are and not view this mandala as an end goal. Um, so again, this analogy of the donut, you know, don't just look at the final end point, but enjoy the, you know, dwell in the middle part, the gooey, sticky, runny, bread, sweet part. Um, so the enlightened mandala, instead of being an endpoint, is more of a moving, changing, unfolding process. And it's that way whether we're conscious of it or not. So it's happening. You know, it's doing its thing. And then we're, we're doing whatever we're doing. And that's, that's happening. I'm coming to believe that even though it's not sort of a natural understanding of mine that I, you know, was born with. So my belief, and especially my recent experience, so recently, since I was given this assignment, I took on trying to experience mandala in my life, trying to apply this construct or concept or phenomena to my life. And my belief now and my experience is that life is just better, you know, when you're aware of the mandala and when you're trying to jive with it, you know, living in tune with it. It's, you know, it can be nice. It can be fun. So, I mean, that's my pitch. I think it creates a more pleasurable, peaceful, even euphoric or blissful experience to, to live within this mandala. Mandala is instinctive, Rob Fries says. He says, even almost at a cellular level. Now, one of my questions last time in Darshan was, how, Lama? How does this, you know, and he, he avoided that question a bit. But it, it is instinctive to optimize our being in each moment and to live the healthiest, fullest version we can. And that's part of the mandala idea. Lamala says, mandala means that there's some kind of an internal organic organization going on. And he says that it's important to be in tune with it. You know, I recently came across some quotes from Albert Einstein. So, I mean, this isn't just like Tibetan Buddhist stuff. And it struck me how it sort of is saying some of the same stuff. 
One of his quotes, one thing I have learned in a long life that all of our science measured against reality is primitive and childlike. We still do not know one thousandth of one percent of what nature has revealed to us. It is entirely possible that behind the perception of our senses, worlds are hidden, which we are unaware of. He writes, when something vibrates, the electrons of the entire universe resonate with it. Everything is connected. We are souls dressed up in sacred biochemical garments, and our bodies are the instruments through which our souls play their music. I mean, this is Al. I mean, this is a scientist guy. He also writes, everything is determined, every beginning and ending, by forces over which we have no control. It is determined for the insects as well as for the star. Human beings, vegetables, or comic dust, we, are all, we all dance to a mysterious tune, entombed in the distance by an invisible piper. You know, it's just like, even he thinks there's stuff going on out here, guys. I, I think it's pretty funny. Now, here's something Lamela told me that I think would be fun to talk about at the end when we have some discussion. I still don't really get it, but I thought it was cool. Lamela says the pattern of organization is knowable. I mean, come on, wouldn't that be cool to actually know what all this is that is going on that mostly we're blind to? But Lama says that we have to learn to pay attention to this mandala. And I think that's pretty important too. Now, Lama, when he talks to me, he'll say there's the enlightened mandala and there's the samsaric mandala. Like there's two different planes to this mandala. You know, you're either on the, the fun bus or the not so fun bus. And Rob Priest says that our suffering in life is due in part to blocking and freezing this natural unfolding of our being rather than allowing its centering and integrative capacity. You know, so I think that's sort of the same thing as, as being on the samsara mandala when you're not open to the, you know, to this quality. So, and I think that's, I expect that's what Lama means as well. And Lama says that it's just that we're not paying attention to the enlightened mandala as much as we are paying attention to the samsaric mandala. I think that's pretty profound too, because when I think of my days and the minutes I spend in my day, how much of it am I dwelling in emptiness, the enlightened mandala, Buddha nature versus how much am I dwelling in all the hard stuff? You know, all the stuff that seems like it's not going well, all the stuff that's challenging. I mean, if I measure it in minutes, it's way more time in the samsara mandala than in the enlightened mandala. Even if we all meditated our 24 minutes, I mean, it's still 24 minutes and all the rest of the time, who knows where our mind is. It's crazy. I think this enlightened mandala is magic in a way. And tuning into it, it just creates this sort of magic. And I wanted to read a couple other pieces from Rob Priest. He says, the mandala has the capacity to bring together elements that often conflict, unifying opposites to bring a sense of cohesion to things that don't automatically fit together well. This is important in terms of how we find a resolution to conflicting elements in our nature to bring them into some sort of cohesive relationship. And he also says it's important to recognize that each of us is creating our reality from moment to moment. This reality is the essence of the mandala of our totality nature. We each inhabit a mandala that is arising and passing in each moment. And there is an aspect of our nature that is maintaining a sense of wholeness in the process. So, in fact, we live in this constantly changing environment that is continually impacting us in different ways. And, and one thing Lama said some talks ago is there's sort of a world out there, and then there's what we bring to the world, you know, and how we, how we show up to it and connect with it, it makes a difference. Another analogy that came up for me in thinking this through is surfing. Has anybody surfed? Ah, we got surfer. Anybody surf on Zoom land? Can't see people very well. Dan's giving me, oh, Kathy surfed. I've never surfed, but when I was a kid, my parents would take us to the ocean. Sometimes they'd drive us down to Southern California where it's, you know, actually 
a place you could swim in the ocean without a wetsuit. And we would play in the waves. Um, and so I body surfed. And I remember um, some characteristics of playing in the waves. One of them is there seemed to be this phenomena of like small wave, small wave, small wave, small wave, big wave. And after the big wave, small wave, small wave, small wave. And if you were watching, you could, you know, I guess with surfers, at least with me as a body surfer, I wanted to know when the big wave was coming compared to the small waves. If you want to ride the waves, the small ones aren't very fun. And if you don't want to get smashed by the waves, the big ones are really important to pay attention to. And I would imagine a, a surfer, that feeling of being in the zone, riding that wave is just amazing. And there's, I think it's an entunement, in, in you know, of being in tune with the, the quality of the water and the waves and being in touch with whether the waves are the rideable ones or the ones you want to watch out for and not get smashed by. So I think of mandala in my life now sort of as a surfing thing, connecting with the flow of what's going on and trying to stay, you know, on top of the wave or be aware of it at least. So, but, but interestingly, being out of balance is also part of the mandala. You know, so it's fine when everything's working well and you're, you know, you're catching yourself, not making mistakes and everything's like you're cruising along and you're so pleased, but actually being off kilter is also part of this mandala. So um, wholeness is not some sort of fixed or static space and it's not a space, a, a point of perfection either. You know, we're constantly going into and out of balance. And that's part of mandala. So to assume that being out of balance is, is a problem that needs to be fixed is an error in this whole mandala game. You know, it's just being aware. If we're continually moving in and out of balance and the willingness to move in and out of balance is part of the mandala. So from a Buddhist point of view, one of the roots of suffering is grasping, right? And when we grasp to everything being imbalance then we're freezing or solidifying and thereby hurting ourselves you know we're ending up in the samsaric mandala instead of the enlightened mandala the lama says that mandala is the pattern or process itself in the samsaric paradigm we're always creating a substrate behind the phenomenon and I notice this too, if I pay attention, you know, for me, this last week was pretty crazy. I mean, we had in Sacramento anyway, most of you are around here. We had these like God awful temperatures for like 10 days in a row. And then out where I am, there's this mosquito fire going on up by Forest Hill. So the air quality index the last few days has been 500. You know, you, it's like so unhealthy. I woke up one morning and the smoke, it felt like smoke was coming in my house and it was coming in my house. My son had this awful oral surgery that he had to get through. And then Lotus View Ranch got put on the evacuation alert list, you know, and half my family still lives there. And we all, you know, a lot of us know that that's a very special place for Lion's Roar. So, I mean, it's just been one of those weeks, right? And it can feel kind of off balance. Um, so it's, I think it's harder when you're in the midst of it, to not get gripped, you know, to not get like, oh, I had these voices going through me. I'm like, this is dystopia. What is going on with the world right now? You know, and as soon as I notice myself going there, I'm like, oh, this is the grasping, you know, this is the samsaric substrate that Lama's talking about. So if I pay attention, I can begin to tell when I'm falling into that samsaric mandal now. And I mean, mostly you can tell because it doesn't feel good, right? You feel like, ah, this, ah, I don't like it. It feels bad. I'm frustrated. I'm sad. Or, or you know, I'm not so much sad. I'd say the frustrated, the angry, the storyline behind it. Um, so I wanted to give you another reading by read a little bit from an article that Joan Halifax wrote. Joan Halifax is a um, Zen Roshi. She's also a social activist, um, and she runs a, a Zen center, Upaya Zen Center, and she's written a couple articles, and this is from one called Meeting the More and Marrow, What Moral Anguish, Grief, and Fear Give Us. So it's kind of long. I'm sorry. Have a nap if you don't like me blogging on so long. She writes, 
some of us receive the precious opportunity in this time to use the struggles that we are experiencing. And it, it's down a bit in this article, so it's you can maybe try to read it if you want, but I just wanted them to at least give you the link in case you wanted to review it. It's a really fascinating article. Okay. We have heeded the call to abandon futility and meet our moral anguish, our grief, and our fear with openness and curiosity. We have also allowed ourselves to be worked by the power of adversity in order to meet the unfolding and uncertain present with inquiry, hope, awe, and loving action. And if we can't, then we do not turn away from that. Sometimes we have to heap. Sometimes we make unfortunate mistakes and withdraw from the world in shame. Sometimes we falter in the midst. Sometimes we fall apart and stay that way a long time. And sometimes we need to step away, to retreat, to take a backward step. It is simply not our time to step forward. But no, we too are being worked. And others are being worked in their own way. It is not to add the weight of judgment onto the burden that we are already carrying. It is not to turn away from our current experience, even if our response does not meet our so-called standards. It's rather to meet it with, Hello, old friend. I know you. And for those of us who encounter moral anguish, grief, and fear head on, may we also come to meet our tangled world head on and realize that this is sacred work. As astrophysicist Adam Frank suggests, he writes, it goes back to the very roots of being human, to a time when our hunter-gatherer ancestors could feel the sense of more when they came on a bend in a river or stumbled across a mountain glade. The sacred is the opposite of all those times when we are living in our heads, mulling over our worries or focused on just trying to get by. I think that's Lama's substrate there she's referring to. Sacredness appears in those moments when life overflows its banks. When we see the vast variegated and infinite network of life and being and life and being we each are a part of. Oh, I'm sorry, that was all Adam Frank's words. So Joan writes, I believe this more is another given we do not divert our when we do not divert our gaze, when we do not turn away from anguish, when we do not turn away from this world, this earth, from each other, from ourselves. The more of the sacred rests in the very marrow of our lives, and as well rests between us and all beings and things. So I, um, you know, I'm just about to close, but I think coming back to center is key. You know, coming back to ourselves and to center. And Lama has told me the enlightened mandala is no different than Buddha nature. You know, so whether it's emptiness or Buddha nature or what you resonate with, I mean, I think it's helpful to think of mandala that way. We're just coming back to center. We could say that's what our Buddha nature is optimizing all the time. Priest writes, we see the mandala as an expression of our whole reality arising and passing from moment to moment as the play of emptiness. The key again, according to Lama, is paying attention to Buddha nature or enlightened mandala. Then a sense of euphoria starts to come into one's life, or it may just be a general sense of well-being or pleasure, or even there could be some bliss, essentially the jelly part of the donut, the sweet part. So I just wanted to close again with some words of a woman that I really respect a lot, Joanna Macy. She's also a social and environmental activist, and I've had the benefit of doing a couple extended workshops with her, and she's a Tibetan Buddhist, you know, by training. She writes, we consist of and are sustained by interweaving currents of matter, energy, and information that flow through us, interconnecting us with our environment and other beings. Yet we are accustomed to identifying ourselves only with that small arc of the flow. Through that, though that is lit like the narrow beam of a flashlight by our individual subjective awareness. But we don't have to so limit our self-perceptions. It is plausible to align our identity with a larger pattern, interexistent with all beings. She also writes, to be alive in this beautiful self-organizing universe to participate in the dance of life, 
with senses to perceive it, lungs that breathe it, organs that draw nourishment from it, is a wonder beyond words. So I'll stop there and I welcome any discussion. I don't know, questions doesn't really seem relevant, but maybe we can discuss either your own experience or anything that arose for you when I was talking. I remember when I saw the first time um, this picture of the universe where uh, they, they start showing the planets, our, our uh, sun and the constellations and then other suns. And then they start to zooming out more and more. And then they show, when they show all the galaxies, all the universe or the part of the universe that they photograph, the shape is like, is like a Nespero like this. Mm -hmm. And then I, and then I saw the, at the same time, I, I believe it was a, a, in, the, in the same years that we came with the picture of the DNA being exactly the same shape of, of the galaxies. And I have one of those aha moments like, oh, so it's not just a theory that we are the universe. It's like every cell, it's a whole universe. Uh, so those, those ideas that we work, work with for many years that organize the universe, uh, I, think, I think because we, we see chaotic and disorganization because we see just the addition of reality so uh, like if i watch the news every day i can connect with every scene that's going wrong in every part of the world right now in real time but it's impossible to connect with every scene positive going on at this very moment nobody gonna transmit that in 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 online or TV or, or on the news. News is always the bad stuff. So the addition we do, we leave lives editing things for the worst. And, and then we see this word really chaotic. And there is, the, and the bad stuff is all real. They are not, I'm not saying that they are not real. I'm saying that we don't see reality as a whole. It's like we just see a little piece of the mandala, but we don't try to see the, the whole picture. Yeah, I think that's an excellent observation. You know, one thing I liked about that article that Joan Wright and, wrote, and I didn't read it all, but she points out that people and societies are transforming all the time. You know, so even though it seems like everybody's effed up, you know, human beings or your neighbors effed up or the, you know, the society, political systems that they they are transforming you know that experience of them doing that that concept somehow in some way they're transforming you know so i don't even think it's a matter of bad versus good there's just like there's can be good and the bad too man that's a great story though i like your observation i got one in the back too you got to wait for Doug. Sorry. Uh -huh. yeah, I never thought about Monterey Report as a uh, process uh, like that. I mean, it sounds like something I read about in Dallas and about the, the, everything flowing with the Dow. In this uh -huh. case, everything is going with the Mandela principle and if you go with it, it's organizing everything in the best way possible. And if you don't, I guess the Samsara Mandela is just a small piece of it. And you think that's the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's a dead end. <laughs> yeah. It's just part of it. So that's very interesting. It's a whole different way of looking at it. The, the picture of the model then shows that everything actually is whole and interrelated. Yeah. <laughs> and But that's in more than three dimensions. Exactly. I mean, I, I find these pictures a little bit intimidating, you know, until you're familiar with them or, the, and it takes probably 
decades, if not lifetimes to get familiar, they can be intimidating. And I don't think that's really the point of, you know, living a life in, in the mandala. Go ahead, please. I think, uh, oh, whoa. Uh, I think my question kind of has like two, two parts in a way. Um, I guess the first one is if the mandala is essentially like the the universe, right? Kind of how it's, but it's like a structured representation of the universe, or like you said, it ebbs and changes. But um, does everyone have their own mandala, or is it all just one combined one? Because if it is the universe, right, we're all part of it. So it's just one. So we all have the same. And then also, like, do you think it's possible for the mandala to, if there is a universal one? Is it always trending towards more enlightened activity? Or do you think that's also going to be like shifting as well? Um, well, I'll give you my opinion, which is, you know, this much understanding. This much understanding. You know, again, I think it's easy to think about mandala as a thing. And Lama will emphasize that it's more of a flow or a process. So in terms of your first question, I see the flow happening. It's happening everywhere all at once. And we have our own individual experience of it, you know, where we are in this flow. And then there's sort of the grander version that we are connected to. And then um, what was your second question again? Sorry. But you had a different one too. Also, like, um, oh. with uh, yeah, with I guess the universal kind of mandala or the big flow we're all part of. Do you think that that is always like trending more towards enlightened activity, or, you know, do you think there's like yeah. periods of it that it kind of less enlightened activity, more enlightened activity? I think collectively, not necessarily. I mean, I think the industrial revolution and property ownership started us on an unenlightened mandala. Um, you know, countries and political systems and everything. And of course, some people are trending towards an enlightened mandala. Hopefully all of us here are. And hopefully in some sense, everybody, you know, individuals and societies have their bit of that trend. But the overall direction, you know, wind will turn. That's like the whole story of Shambhala, right? That there's going to be this mass destruction and and then Kala Chakra is going to come and save us all and from death and destruction. So I, I mean, I think there's trending going on and I don't think it's always up, but I think there is an up element to everything all the time. That's my guess. Others have thoughts or any questions? Thank you, Ellen. Yeah, you're welcome. How about the, the Zoomers? Any thoughts or questions? You, you're not as excited about this talk because we have jelly donuts in the kitchen. I'm sorry that I couldn't Zoom them to you. I know it is, but it's the truth. So what am I going to do? And if nobody's got any question, I want to pose again this question or this point that Lama raised because I, I think that's just the coolest thing. He says the structure of this enlightened mandala is knowable. I mean, if we could know the structure, isn't that like having a secret map to nirvana? How is it knowable? And how do we get to know it? If that's true. I mean, it must be true. Lama said it, right? But what, any thoughts? The knowability? Any brainstorming? Yeah, you got to get to the mic again. Because this is going to be, this is going to be important, what you say. I think sometimes we forget like the mandala is a representation, right? Is a is a symbol, is a symbolic representation of a reality. And 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 symbols they are like a language. So if you if you speak the language, you understand the words. But if some if you don't speak Chinese and somebody says something to you in Chinese, it will be sound just like sounds and even if you do your best to try to guess what the person is telling you if you don't have any uh, chinese 
you're not going to guess. It's just sounds for you. So and that's everybody who don't speak, a, uh, listen to a language that they don't speak, have this feeling, right? So the mandala is a language of symbols. And I love the fact that you mentioned uh, as a process, because, because in my experiences, every mandala, it, it's representing a process that can be inside us or outside us, like in this question. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is a mandala for, for how, how myself organize my, my psychology, my mind, or my life. And there is a big mandala that, that can be this sangha. This sangha is a mandala. So I'm interacting with this, another mandala called sangha, and I'm interacting with other mandalas, right, in, in different scales. So I think the problem is, is that we, we forgot that's a language, and we don't try to learn the language in order to see the symbol as, a, as an objective uh, representation of a process. So you know what the process is when you, but then if you forget the mandala for a second and say, do you think the relationship between all the sangha is a process? Yeah, it's a process. Could you represent that, that in a mandala? Could you draw, draw a mandala representing the sangha? Like how many members there is, how many people are connected to each other, and yeah, it's possible to make a mandala represent representing this. I think. I've been thinking a lot um, about this. How do we know? How you said we could know this, uh, the ultimate, maybe mandala and the language. How can we learn this language? And I, to me, I believe it's by being aware, just really remembering constantly and stepping out of our little tiny mandala that we are focusing on, the negative news or the whatever, the confusion we feel and things that are happening to us. And, if we can sit enough to become aware of the truths of what you've been saying to us, Alan, which I think has been profound, I think that's how we learn to know by not just taking part in our own personal little tiny concentration on our mandala. Each one is a mandala. Every part of us is a structure, you know, an interactive structure and a flow structure. But we're not going toward it or it's not changing. It's, you know, there's no, well, will it get bigger? Will I understand? But the whole essence of the entirety is, no, so we need to know and realize that is the truth and be aware of it. And I think the more we just sit and go, oh, oh yeah, this isn't the be all, this little moment of my own mandala. So I think it's all about awareness and training ourselves and our minds to not grasp onto our own mandala. I think that's good, both both the last two comments, because it kind of made me realize, I mean, something you said about the language. I, I always have these beefs. I go to Lama. It's like, why, why are you making us learn this stuff? Like the cosmology, I kind of do that. Like, this doesn't make any sense to me. Why are you making me do this? It doesn't even feel right. I think part of it, and you know, the Buddha Dharma study program with all this esoteric philosophy and such, and you usually will respond, well, the language is important to know. You know, we have to have a common vocabulary. And he throws it back on me. You couldn't talk about electric grids with somebody that didn't know the language, right? So we have to have this common language to get anywhere as a Sangha or a Dharma student. And then I think, Sue, what you said, it sort of makes me realize maybe this whole path is how you know. You know, maybe it's no different than sort of working your way towards that enlightened, in touch with the Buddha nature. Maybe when we get get there, which I discourage, you know, that as a goal, we will know. You know, maybe it's all one and the same. So it's kind of good news and not so good news because it doesn't mean there's there's no quick knowing. You know, there's no Google Maps for how you find your way to it. So it's good though, good discussion. Yeah. Any thoughts out there?
I saw a couple of uh, chat questions. One was a question like, how do we know? And I think that's the question we raised. And then Marie put a chat in there. And we can read them, I guess. You guys could raise your hand or whatever you need to do, speak up. And they need to raise their hand or they just talk. You can just talk. So Marie said, if emptiness is knowable, the structure of the mandala must also be knowable. That's good. Angie said, in Buddhism, are mandalas created, drawn by followers, or only teachers and leaders? That's a good question. I mean, I think, well, I think mandala drawing can be a practice, you know, so in that sense, they would be drawn by followers. I think the ones we have in our tankas are, are drawn by really experts. Um, and this kind of mandala we're talking about is like there's no drawing for it necessarily, right? Yeah, nobody originated them. I mean, this iconography that we have on the Tonkas and stuff, somebody somebody originated. But if you go back and read this cosmology, finding the origin of some of this iconographic stuff is just really bizarre, too. It's like it has no origin almost. Mind-blowing. Okay, otherwise, I guess we should go to closing prayers, dedication, and... No. Oh. For us here, jelly donuts. Well, thank you, you all, for being such a nice audience. So, so we'll do dedication. Can we share dedication? Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chanrizig, Tenzin, Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Those on Jaffa and make requests at your holy feet. Thank you, Patty, and to the tech crew, and to all of you for coming. Oh, and announcements. Don't go away just yet. Announcements. So this announcement is regarding um, Pinchin Rinpoche. Uh, he, I, I'm not positive about his connection with this family, but he had us put in our uh, roar about this family that has a little child and uh, he needs a kidney transplant and he's six years old. And so I shared the link and a friend brought to my attention that the link um, for making donations, there's some, some trouble there. So uh, I'm not sure if that trouble is specific to a person, but if you have trouble making donation to Kenshin Rinpoche's um, fundraising drive for this little child, please, uh, you can make a donation to Lions for Dharma Center and put in the memo um, that it's for Kenshin Rinpoche's child. Um, I don't have his name at the top of my tongue, but I know that this is a very legitimate cause and Kenshin Rinpoche is a wonderful friend and wants to help us join him and help him. So that's my main announcement. Thank you. Thanks, friends. See you soon. <laughs>